Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our Cooping a Call webinar, How to Handle Consent to be Compliant with the GDPR and the upcoming e-privacy regulations. The webinar is supported by iWelcome. The speakers today are Martin Stultians, who is Vice President of Corporate Development at iWelcome, and me, Martin Kuppinger, I'm Principal Analyst at Kuppinger Coal. You can reach me at mk at kuppingercoal.com. Before we start, just very quickly some housekeeping information and some um, general information about the webinar. Kuppinger Coal is an analyst company. We're headquartered in Germany. Um, focus on information security, identity management, and other areas concerning the digital transformation. Um, have a team in various countries, including the US and Singapore. And our business is focused on three pillars. One is research, uh, where we cover markets and trends, do our flagship product, um, Leadership Compass, and deliver various types of research. Then we have our events. Um, I'll touch this in a minute, where we do things like webinars and conferences, and we have our advisory business where we support businesses in defining their strategies, roadmaps, making um, decisions about tools and their overall architectural blueprints. This is what we are doing as Cooping or Coal. In advisory, we focus on benchmarking optimization, so measuring you against others and against sort of our baselines. Uh, in strategy support, architecture and technology support, and project guidance. And as I've said, we have a couple of upcoming events. So the next events are our Consumer Identity World Singapore. So we had already had two events, one in the US, one in Europe, and we will have <coughs> um, then one in Singapore as well. Plus we have our Cybersecurity Leadership Summit and the German Language Cyber Access Summit, uh, both running next week in Berlin. And then next year, obviously, our European Identity Conference in May will follow, and the Blockchain Enterprise event will be uh, will run in February in Frankfurt. Some guidelines for the webinar, you are muted centrally, so you don't have to mute or unmute yourself. We are controlling these features. We are recording the webinar and will make the podcast recording available by usually latest tomorrow, um, as well as we will make the slide decks available for download so you don't have to sort of print down everything we are doing. And there will be a Q&A session at the end. Um, I always recommend that you enter questions during the flow of the webinars when you have to, these questions so that we have a good list of questions for our lively Q&A session at the end of our webinar. Having said this, let's have a look at the agenda. The agenda, as usual, um, consists of three parts. In the first part, I'll talk about the business aspects of consent management. So why is this a primarily business topic and not a pure play IT topic? In the second part, then Martin and students will talk about the technical foundation for consent and how to do it right for the consumer. And as I've said, then in the third part, we will do a Q&A session where we can answer and cover all the questions you might have on this topic. So let's start with a Quick wrap up, so I assume most of you are to some extent familiar with what the GDPR brings, but let's start with a quick wrap up of some of the key aspects um, of GDPR. Um, one of the in most important things, and particularly around consent, is unless another legal basis is in place, consent is required prior to processing personal data. Such basis could be a contract, um, such basis could be a law, but if there's nothing in place, it's about consent. There's a concept of legitimate interest, but this is a pretty weak concept, so better go for contracts or explicit consent. It's the safe way to do it. So this consent has to be freely given, informed, unambiguous, and it must consist of clear statements of affirmative action. So it's not that you just say, I understand this as consent given. It must be really a very explicit and clear process. We have consent per purpose, and it might be also be revoked as um, in general, so all of the consent you gave, or per purpose. So I can uh, revoke my consent for the use of my data for a certain purpose. We need a data protection officers, which can be external 
for certain types of data processing, we need to perform more complex specific data protection impact assessments to understand the risk and the proof that we're doing what we need to do. We have the data breach notification requirement within 72 hours, which is not that long. However, this is towards the data protection authorities, not towards the individual data subject. So the data subject uh, must be informed in certain scenarios, but not in all. Um, again, something you need to look at. Um, there are a lot of data control rights, such as the right to be forgotten, the right to freeze data processing, the right to export data and to edit it. We need to support and we need to have privacy by default and design, which are mandatory concepts. So as you all know, these days GDPR is changing a lot of um, aspects of how we collect personally identifiable information, how we process it, how we deal with that. And one of the still very fundamental concepts is consent. And Obviously, consent is something which um, changes the way we work with the customers and consumers when we look at it from a from a, a consumer identity perspective, because it means we need to gather that consent. Um, we need to enable people to change their consent. So we need to also change sort of the customer journey because it's about someone is coming in, we need him to ask him for consent, we need to give him the ability to manage his consent, etc. And that is a change in the customer journey. And so there's obviously an impact on the way we interact with others. Um, so there's a business impact of consent management. And as I've said, there are a couple of requirements in this play between the business and the consumers. So it is the clear affirmative action. So which on the other hand means silent, so pre-ticked boxes or inactivity is presumed inadequate to confer consent. So it's not that you could say, if he doesn't say anything, I assume that he gave consent. And that is, for instance, when you look at most of the websites today, this um, if you continue using that website, uh, you give consent uh, for collecting data via cookies, etc. No, that is not GDPR compliant. It also needs to be freely given uh, specific. So what is collected? That is also the informed part and on the big list. So we you can't drive someone in, um, in just the situation of you have to give consent for being allowed to do that. It shall, shall be as easy to withdraw consent as to give it. Another big challenge. So if you only once say, um, click OK to accept everything when you visit our service, uh, but have no simple means to revoke it, it's not sufficient. Um, explicit consent, I've talked about this. Um, parental consent for processing children's personal data. Um, and also when, when it's about um, automated profiling and other things, so decision-making, we have again um, specific and complex consent requirements. And that means we have to think about um, how do we do that right? How do we deal with our customers, our consumers? to gather the consent we need for our business models. It might even lead to a situation where we need to think about, will this business model continue to work or do we need to change the business model? Um, so there's an obvious impact of this consent on the user journey and the consent life cycle. As I've said, um, it must be simple and clear to understand. So. We shouldn't leave the customer back with questions about why to give consent. So if you just say we need that consent, but don't explain the benefit the customer has, it is not very likely that he will give the consent. So in this balance between the consumer on one hand and the um, and the uh, business on the other side, it is about showing we need that information from you 
to deliver that benefit, that service to you. So this is what we need to, to, to explain because otherwise people will be in tendency reluctant to give consent, particularly when they understand what exactly is collected and we have to explain what is collected exactly for which purpose. So we also need to find easy and low intrusive ways for requesting additional consent. So if you have another purpose, we need consent for this new purpose. Um, we need to be prepared, prepared for this. We need to understand, okay, there are new business cases and that changes the way we interact. It changes the customer journey. It requires additional consent. So we need to bring these things together. So what happens in business? What is the business model? What, why is business collecting this? And how do we, um, how do we shape our customer journey or our user journey in a constant life cycle? And we, we in fact, will have, in particular with also the upcoming e-directive regulation, even more need to do this far more explicit than it is done these days with, at, at most websites with just still the, oh, you need to accept the cookies to continue using that website. That will not be sufficient. And Martin in his presentation will um, go a little bit more into detail on this. And obviously the entire thing around consumer identity is that it's not only an identity, Key play. So when we look at who's involved, it becomes very clear that we need for all these things around consumer identity, privacy, consent, cons etc. We need to bring a lot of parties to a table and to make them work together. So we obviously have sales with their CRM system. We have marketing with their marketing automated um, automation systems. We have the IAM people who look at managing the identities, authentication, things like that. Now, we might have the chief digital officer or chief digital business officer who looks at the customer from the digital transformation perspective and how to change the business uh, with these, um, who looks at new business models and we need to understand what does it mean from a uh, privacy perspective, from the perspective of collecting data, which new consent do we need for that, how does it change the interaction, which new types of data subjects or customers, consumers have we really, uh, to deal with, etc. We have obviously a lot of websites where, which are owned by someone who runs a certain type of whatever e-commerce service or other things which store certain types of data. We have uh, the business departments for all their portals. We have um, corporate audit, which looks at KYC, so the know your customer stuff, the data protection officers. So we have a lot of parties which are involved. Um, but at the end, it becomes very clear that IT for itself can't solve this issue because it's not only an IT issue. The entire aspect of managing consumer identities, managing the customer journey, uh, defining which authentications are supported and particular how we work and how we deal with consent and how this influences our customer journey is something where we need to bring the relevant parties to one table and to understand what does it mean down or up to the business model. So where the chief digital officer or the business departments need to be involved because obviously the way collect consent, we gather consent, and the ability to gather consent affects many business models. So um, when we go a little ahead, um, again, it's about convincing the consumer about the value of consent. So demonstrate or explain the benefits. You might add benefits, for instance, lotteries. And I remember my um, gas and um, water uh, utility company, a while ago sent me a mail and said, okay, we, we'd like to, whatever, spam you with, uh, they've said it a little different, but basically we'd like to spam you with market, marketing emails, etc. Please give us our consent. And oh yes, when you give the consent, you can, um, uh, we will have this lottery and there are some super attractive prizes and there were some really interesting ones. I really considered giving my consent uh, until the lottery is done and then revoke it again. Um, so things like that might work to some extent. Um, but we also should think at this from a more positive perspective. So how can consumer identity management also maybe improve the user journey or improve the way that we do business with people? So um, 
we have this informed consent. So why do you want my data? What are you going to do with it? And basically the customer also asks the question, what do I get out of it? So what are my rewards for granting consent? Which also might, on the other hand, open the doors for new business models. So I'm when I have audiences in front of me, I every now and then I ask questions about, um, so who of you would be pay would be willing to pay for whatever amount for that or that type of service? So who would be willing to pay two euros for a search engine that delivers super good results without collecting all the data and sharing all the data about you? And there's a significant portion of people who say, yes, I would be willing to whatever spend two euros or dollars a month. Um, there are a couple of people as well, probably the same group, which says, no, not at all. I just pay with my privacy. Um, and there are some which are sort of indifferent, but there's a significant portion of people who are willing to pay for more privacy. And not only in Germany, this works quite well in other countries as well. So, but if we do that, if we look at um, how we work with that, it's always about um, understanding how does this really work well, this user journey and the, all the things we are doing for the customer. And there are some s simple things, and it's just on, on the next slide, are just some, some samples for, for things we, can, uh, we should to keep in mind. So basically, it's about getting the balance right. Less data means low friction. Much data means high friction. So the more we collect, the more friction potential is there, the bigger the value must be. Um, and we need to understand what we really need. And there are very different scenarios. So if we use a taxi in a very traditional way, we don't need a phone, we don't need an app, we don't need an account, no password, no registration. There's not even PII stored, at least if I pay cash. So I'm, I'm from Germany, we still tend to pay uh, by cash. Um, so I'm totally anonymous when I'm using a taxi, as long as I don't talk too much with the taxi driver. If I would go to Uber or Lyft or whatever, I need a phone, an app, an account, I have a registration process, um, a lot of PII stored. And obviously a lot of people go for that approach because they say the benefit of doing so is um, bigger than what I have to, to share. But the more they learn about what they have to share, uh, the, the different their decision might look like. And that is something we need to understand. We need to understand are people considering this, what we're doing valuable enough um, to give their consent? Will they use their service with all the other restrictions GDPR brings with it? So um, we, we don't need to, so the unambiguous thing, for instance. Um, but it's, it's something we need to understand. And we also need to understand that we shouldn't, in whichever way, um, push our customers too much in to answering questions and to, in fact, in the one or other way, annoying them by sort of gathering some sort of consent or other information in a too intrusive way. So um, probably all of us are annoyed to some extent of dialogue boxes popping up when we are looking at a website saying, oh, do you have questions about that? Type your questions. Do you want assistance? So you're rarely five seconds on a website and they ask for, the pop-up uh, window pops up from the chat bot saying, oh, um, do, I, do you need help, et cetera? Um, frequently it's annoying or this, oh, the mailing list and you will get some totally irrelevant things here. So if you give something, then give something relevant back and better convince your customer of the value of sharing the data because you use the data for a purpose, for a concrete purpose where the customer has a benefit than annoying the customer and trying to gather a lot of data where you maybe not even know why you are collecting it. And I still believe that a lot of businesses are collecting too much data, which they, they not really need. I had this morning, I had a, a scenario uh, where I tried out one of these new um, reusable ID schemes um, we, we see popping up uh, these days so where I can use that one ID for a lot of services. Then I accessed the first service and as I said, that service said, I also need your birth date. It was an e-commerce site and there's absolutely no need for them to know my birth date. What they might need to know is 
whether I'm above a certain age. In that case, not even that, because it was not about alcohol, it was not about drugs. Uh, anyway, weapons also not, I'm from Germany, etc. So um, it was ridiculous, it was totally unnecessary, but they're asking, and the one thing I did is I just stopped the process at that point. So stop annoying your customers, but think about trust and usability and providing the alternatives for the customer. So you want to have a long-term sustainable relationship with your customer, um, and that is built on trust. If the customer trusts you, he will tell you more, he will do more with you, the business will be better. It's about usability, so make the flow, the customer journey simple, even with consent. Martin will talk a lot about that. And think about alternatives, so if someone doesn't want to share the data, how do you keep him as a customer? So particularly if this data is not really required for your business model, or maybe there's a business model for you where you can earn potentially even more money uh, without driving the customer in, giving away all information about him. So what you definitely should do as one part of rethinking consent and the, where, where really the business and the IT things come together is stop thinking inside out and thinking outside in. So most businesses think very much inside out. So to think about what works best for us, how can I collect as much PII as I want, which authentication works best, how should this process look like, um, all that stuff. And they say, okay, consumer, you do what we want you to do. But I think that's not the right way to treat a customer and to build a long-term successful relationship. Think it different. Think about what works best for them. So why should they share information with us? Because they have a benefit. How can I shape my authentication? Um, how should the process look like? Not No cumbersome registration. How can he use the way to authenticate he wants to use? and do what the customer wants to do. And that obviously is not a decision IT can make for itself. IT can support it, consumer identity can support it, but it goes well beyond that. With that, I hand over to Martin, who right now will talk about the technical foundation for consent and how to do it right for the consumer. And he will also touch probably a lot of other topics around consent, consumer identity, and all this experience from a lot of customers. So Martin, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, for uh, this introduction. Um, and uh, uh, very welcome for the audience. Um, I welcome, as a, in a very short introduction, is an uh, identity as a service provider. We provide a platform. We are a European-based company. Actually, we are uh, based out of Amsterdam. And uh, uh, as we are focusing on external users in our platform and mainly consumers, we had to foundationally implement uh, GDPR. Um, and uh, one of the main components, of course, in GDPR is uh, consent. I will talk um, uh, about uh, our experiences with uh, these implementation, what it meant for us, how we have uh, solved uh, things and uh, how we are serving our customers with um, uh, the with platform and also with challenges that still resides on their side, because in the end we deliver a platform. Um, I'm not a lawyer, um, so uh, I uh, will not go in details in, in the law. Um, and um, what I um, want to emphasize is uh, exactly what uh, Martin already emphasized. Um, it is um, about uh, delighting the customer. It's about uh, building trust and uh, getting retention. Um, and uh, actually, for the internal side, it is about creating actionable consumer data. Uh, if you don't have consent, then by law, you cannot use that data for um, uh, marketing and sales. So um, uh, the internal value is about creating actionable consumer data. Uh, this picture shows you a bit and, and gives a bit of the flavor that uh, uh, we want to do. We want to delight that customer. We want to think uh, outside in with regard to consent. Well, a bit more in, um, uh, in, in some uh, details. What we did uh, and what we started about a year ago, if we talk about GDPR, then it's about empowering the customer. Um, and uh, we have seen uh, all kinds of uh, GDPR programs focusing at um, uh, the internal side 
for uh, getting GDPR compliant, uh, uh, identifying where PII resides, who has access, etc. Uh, but um, we have um, started a research um, and we've looked outside in. So from uh, the consumer's perspective, what um, uh, is the consumer deliver in terms of controls with regard to their um, uh, data? Um, so for us, we, we talk about the proof is uh, in the pudding. Um, uh, we've looked at uh, organizations across Europe, uh, in total 89 organizations in seven countries and in uh, six verticals. And here you can uh, see the list of uh, verticals. And um, for the GDPR uh, compliancy, uh, we have looked at the criteria that are relevant from a consumer's perspective. So in terms of the controls that uh, the consumers um, uh, have. Um, well, uh, obviously consent uh, as one of the key controls, the ability to withdraw, right of access, right of recertification, clearness about uh, the retention period. Um, I will not talk a lot about uh, data retention, but that's a topic in itself uh, because data retention uh, may change over time. Uh, we can store certain data for a specific purpose, but that will change over time. For example, in the first year, I can use data for marketing purposes and later on only for statistical uh, reasons. So um, uh, that is a topic in itself. Um, we have uh, tested uh, the uh, websites of these uh, 89 organizations over almost a year. Uh, we started November last year and we, com we, we just completed the research where we included the US because we also see developments in the US uh, with regard to uh, uh, GDPR-alike implementations. Uh, some of you probably have heard of the privacy law in, um, uh, in California. Uh, and if you look at uh, from a country perspective, uh, about to the compliance of these um, uh, of, of two GDPR in these uh, various regions, then um, you see that there are some countries that uh, do overall pretty well. Um, here in this case, it is uh, UK and uh, Germany, Martin. So um, uh, you can be proud on uh, on, on uh, your home country. Uh, and we see other countries, and they are really uh, staying uh, behind. Um, the light green is good, the uh, dark green is okay, and uh, if you go in grey then uh, there are uh, significant uh, gaps in the implementation. Um, of course, 89 organizations sounds like a lot. Uh, in practice, uh, if there are a few outstanding ones, then they influence um, uh, the, the category. Um, if you look at it from uh, an industry perspective, then uh, we see that uh, media and publishing and uh, retail are uh, doing better than uh, other uh, areas. Especially striking was that insurance companies are uh, not very compliant um, uh, to, to GDPR. Um, well, a bit of analysis here. Um, we think that uh, the media and uh, media companies, as well as retailers, they have less of a uh, let's say, strong relationship with customers. Customers can easily move from one organization to another. Um, so they have to invest in uh, trusted relationships. Um, whereas if you uh, are a utilities company or an insurance company, then uh, the uh, stickiness or the retention is, of course, um, uh, higher. Um, so that could be an explanation of um, the uh, compliance. Um, the key findings, all in all, is that um, uh, about 34% uh, percent of all organizations are, uh, well, pretty uncompliant to most of the uh, GDPR requirements. Also, um, what we've seen, and you could not read that from the previous slides, is that um, there are, if you look at the uh, GDPR requirements, then um, the basic GDPR requirements um, right of access, right of recertification, ability to withdraw have been implemented uh, by most organizations. Um, if you look at uh, the more complex uh, GDPR requirements, I already touched on data retention and we'll talk more about uh, consent, they have hardly been implemented. Um, where we thought, uh, our researchers thought that, uh, that consent was needed, 
um, only 12% of uh, the occasions it was actually implemented. And that was quite a, um, uh, for us, uh, well, an uh, unexpected uh, experience. Um, if we look a bit uh, deeper into uh, consent, then uh, there are several things that have to be taken into account. Martin already touched on a few of those. Um, uh, one of the things that is important is that you do not put a, a kind of a consent blanket over all user data, but that you have to be specific and uh, specific with regards to uh, the purpose of use, but also um, on a specific, well, uh, data that you collect. So let's, uh, in IT terms, that you would refer to an attribute. If you look at the progress between uh, November uh, last year and uh, this summer, then there has not been a lot of progress in implementing consent. So we see that organizations have mainly been focusing on the very basic requirements with regards to uh, GDPR. If I um, um, look not only at GDPR, but also at uh, the e-privacy, then uh, we will see, and the e-privacy law is uh, about collecting data, mainly for marketing purposes or for, for personalization. Yeah, we, we know it as, as cookie. Um, it is currently implemented in uh, local laws and it's a directive. It will become a regulation soon. It's still uh, being detailed, but it will be even more strict um, on uh, GDPR. So with uh, the new e-privacy law, uh, there will be a, a a bigger focus on consent. In GDPR, uh, collecting data can be on various grounds, including a contract, uh, a legal ground, etc. cetera. Um, in the e-privacy law, it can only be with consent, with explicit consent. So um, there will be more uh, emphasis on uh, consent. Um, so we looked at it on, uh, let's say, the adoption rates, but um, others also have looked at uh, the adoption of consent from a perspective of individual side. And they've been looking at these large uh, gobblers uh, like Facebook and Google, how they have implemented consent. And um, in uh, one of their reports, and I can really recommend you to uh, have a look at it, uh, you will see that um, uh, in, in that report that uh, these large organizations have designed to, well, as they, uh, and I quote the organization, manipulate users and uh, users are nudged towards privacy intrusive options. And they use all kinds of techniques of doing that, like misleading wording or uh, buttons where the uh, happy flow is with a blue button and unhappy flow is a white button on the white background. So it's not only uh, asking for consent, but also how you implement it. And if you truly um, commit as an organization to uh, serving customers and, and uh, working in line with, uh, in accordance with uh, GDPR. Um, uh, so uh, what we see here is that uh, organizations are preparing a legal case um, uh, for uh, these type of, um, well, uh, misleading implementations of uh, GDPR. Um, of course, as a technology provider, the question is not only what do we see uh, in the market, but also how, why uh, has it not been implemented uh, more and uh, how can we as a technology uh, provider help customers in uh, preparing for that? Um, and um, there are, I think, a few root causes um, why we are where we are and uh, how we can uh, progress from here. One of it is a, a scattered landscape, a scattered landscape that we know from the internal side uh, of uh, with our internal IT systems, we have exactly the same and it's growing pretty rapidly on the outside uh, for the outside world. So there are portal and apps, there are backend uh, applications, uh, ERP systems or what, what have you. And um, in the external landscape, we have not seen so much architecture as um, uh, we see in the, on the internal side. Martin already touched on the different personas that are uh, involved in uh, uh, managing consent. Um, and um, we uh, see that the, the data model um, that we need for a proper consent management, as well as how to expose that data model is, is really a lot different than what we had in the past. That has to do with the data model, the user interface. Uh, so how do we interact with the users? How do we report? 
and uh, how can we integrate that uh, in the landscape. If we look at uh, a typical um, uh, implementation of uh, consumer facing services in most of uh, organizations, we see that, for example, an insurer, they have multiple brands. We see uh, these back office applications and um, so customers have different touch points and these touch points are not integrated, uh, data reporting, etc., cetera, is, uh, is hard. So um, very similar to what we see in uh, the internal side of uh, IT, where organizations have been implementing a kind of an identity platform for integrating uh, internal IT, we see the same need on, um, uh, on the external side. Initially, uh, we have been doing this for, uh, let's say, the 360 view on the customer, but now we also need it for uh, compliance reasons. If uh, a user um, gives consent or revokes consent, then that has to be, uh, that information has to be centrally stored. Um, the DPO now uh, can uh, just work from one database with well, the single source of truth, if you like, for consented data. So working towards an architecture uh, with a central store for uh, consented user data is key for uh, scaling this out to, um, uh, well, being compliant and, and scaling it out. Um, if you look at uh, the people that are involved in a company in uh, implementing these um, uh, uh, consent, then uh, most often, um, uh, of course, the, the chief digital officer or the marketing or the, let's say, the business, as we tend to refer uh, to it, they are one of the key uh, players. Uh, that's what we always see. Uh, we see relatively little, and I would see too little involvement of uh, architecture and uh, IT. Uh, they have different interests. We see uh, more and more um, uh, involvement in our customer implementations of um, uh, the DPO um, and um, as one of our customers said um, uh, I'm not so worried about penalties but I'm very much worried about reputation so uh, reputation risk is uh, probably for really for the board uh, one of the key topics uh, so that means that an activist customer who has just revoked consent will be uh, giving a, uh, an email uh, that he didn't want to receive and he will go on social media and what have you to um, explore his, um, uh, her to, to, to uh, uh, let everybody know that he is annoyed by uh, the brand. Um, but in practice, uh, in, in, in uh, most uh, implementations that we're doing now, the implementation of consent is uh, something that is mainly handled by uh, the business, the chief digital officer in, in this persona, and uh, the, the, the DPO. Um, if you look at how to, cons uh, to, to uh, store consent, that is not so easy. Um, uh, we all know uh, the golden record of uh, customer data yeah, with uh, a user with all uh, kinds of attributes. So this can scale to uh, maybe 50 or 60 attributes of a user. And uh, it can be millions of, uh, of, of users, consumer identities that you want to store. But with um, uh, GDPR, um, you really need to add um, uh, the uh, consent to an attribute. So that means that uh, for each and every attribute, you can have multiple um, uh, purposes of use. And uh, so you have to gather multiple consents over time. So we also talk about uh, consent lifecycle management. In other cases, there is uh, parental consent uh, needed. So then you need to store which parents uh, can or have given consent for that uh, user. So um, the data model or the, the requirements with regard to the data model have changed uh, quite a bit with the implementation, with the uh, demands of uh, GDPR and specifically of uh, consent management. Luckily, um, 
the National Institute for uh, Systems and Technology in the US um, has, a, uh, has developed a standard for metadata. And that is some uh, standard that I can recommend you to have a look at because that uh, pretty much um, solves the requirements for uh, storing consent. It is not about uh, only about uh, storing consents. Uh, it is also about how um, can you collect those consents and how can you share that consent with uh, back office, uh, with back end systems. Um, so you need uh, in uh, the landscapes that I have just uh, shown in a heterogeneous environment, you need to share that consent uh, through uh, APIs. So there, uh, you also need. Uh, either provisioning or consent API, or you need to be able to um, integrate consent information in, for example, in a search and a SAML search and if uh, it's a federated protocol. Um, then there is um, the challenge, how uh, do I interact with, uh, with users when collecting consent? And that is quite a sensitive uh, thing. Uh, what we do with our customers is we make all kinds of uh, mock-ups um, and uh, uh, that is uh, very much to uh, inspire the customer on how they can get a consent. And there is a cultural aspect, so it can differ per country, but also differ per industry or even, uh, let's say, the challenger in an industry, a fintech company, probably communicates different than uh, a large uh, existing bank. So it's about capturing this consent. It is also about asking consent at the right way, in, in the right, uh, with the right uh, wording, instead of uh, asking for consent in a big uh, form where um, you have to, to give all kinds of data. Hey, if, I, if I meet a person, then I only ask for a few data right at the beginning that I really need to know or that are appropriate for the relation that I have at that point. If uh, in a later stage, uh, you're of course able and, and you should ask for uh, further data, you want to do identity proofing, uh, identity validation, all these type of things come in a later stage. So we talk about uh, just in time uh, consent and uh, about this uh, dialogue design. Um, what we see in uh, dialogue design, so about gathering that uh, consent, we uh, see customers uh, developing these A-B testing. And now you're very much relying on that uh, digital uh, department who is very used to, do the, to, to doing these uh, A-B testing. So this A-B testing, testing two kinds of interaction with a uh, customer how to ask consent and then see how uh, uh, the responses are from um, the customer. Do they really understand? Uh, do they return, etc.? That is um, a pretty common in uh, user interaction design, but we have not seen that a lot. And I, we've seen customers uh, struggling with that right uh, in the beginning. So I strongly recommend to uh, start with these uh, uh, user interaction teams. Uh, involve the legal team because they uh, know much better than uh, the user interaction team or the digital team what is really required, how specific we must be with regard to purposes of use. Um, then, uh, eh, you know, fail early, learn quickly. So quick test, do it iteratively in, in small steps. Um, start with a small group and then extend the group to a larger group of users. And what we also see in, in these practices is that um, the, uh, where we thought that we, um, we, we, well, let's say that the IT people had a different uh, expectation of what customers would like um, than uh, what they actually liked. So uh, the user behavior is not always what you expect. Um, so, well, for us, um, that uh, leads to um, uh, some conclusions. We think that um, the, after the basic implementations in organizations, um, there will be a lot of uh, work going forward with data retention, but especially uh, with regard to uh, consent uh, management. Um, the, uh, we see a lot of discussions with our customers where um, uh, digital departments are a bit afraid for implementing that consent. 
because they expect a kind of churn or they lose uh, certain data. Um, then there are discussions about uh, legitimate interest, um, something that we hear all the time. Um, but legitimate interest is not easy either. Uh, legitimate interest uh, requires, for example, uh, the necessity. Um, so that means that there is no other way of gathering that data. Well, and that will pr probably pretty quickly fail. Um, with these discussions, um, we see that uh, today 12% of uh, where we consider consent should be implemented is only implemented. Of course, there can be an area under discussion where uh, customers would say, well, we choose here for legitimate interest, but um, we strongly recommend customers just to start with implementing with these uh, A-B testing to, uh, to get some experience with implementing consent. And then you can always see where in practice legitimate interest ends and where consent uh, begins or vice versa. Um, and uh, in, in the communication with uh, the marketing departments, we see that if you talk about wordings like uh, actionable consumer data, that these uh, departments um, start to better understand that, that we are helping the uh, marketing departments much more than that we are annoying them with implementing hurdles for the end user. Um, with regard to technology and, and standards, we see that uh, there are uh, maturing frameworks. Um, we talked about this uh, metadata. Um, we talked about, uh, we I did not talk about that yet, but uh, there is a standardization committee in uh, Kantara for uh, standardizing consent and uh, consent exchange. And we see uh, the vendors also maturing in this uh, area. Um, all in all, I... Um, um, uh, would say um, uh, and, and recommend you to take a few next steps in uh, the, well, what have we, uh, six, eight weeks uh, up to, uh, uh, to the Christmas period. Um, one of the things is um, accept that you need consent and that the current uh, implementations are insufficient. You probably have seen that uh, the first uh, penalties on organizations have been um, uh, uh, applied on uh, one of the, the first one was I think in Portugal with 400,000 uh, euros um, so the, um, uh, the, 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 the it, it is actually something that penalties are uh, opposed on um, I strongly recommend to take an architectural approach um, and not build consent as, a, as something that you add on, something that you have, to take a structural approach. Explore this uh, NIST uh, data model. Uh, for us, it was uh, very helpful. Um, not only think of the data model, think of uh, the consent exchange. Leverage the upcoming standards, uh, like uh, the consent standards uh, in Kantara Workgroup. And uh, just start uh, uh, experimenting and don't focus on uh, exceptions. Um, we uh, very often end up into discussions where uh, people start with the exceptions rather than with uh, mainstream. Um, most interesting and really nice to do is uh, work on the consumer interaction and uh, think of how to, how and when, so just in time consent, uh, with this A-B testing, you can really come up with nice interactions with the consumers. These are the things that uh, have been valuable for our customers and probably for you as well. So uh, with this, I would like to hand over back to uh, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Um, so let's um, continue with the third part of our webinar, which is the Q&A session. And maybe let's start with one question. I mean, you, you touched this term A-B testing a couple of times. So could you potentially elaborate a little bit more on what it is, how it is done, et cetera? So I believe a lot of more the IT people are not that familiar with it. So okay. maybe you can touch a little bit more on that. Yeah, well, uh, especially in consumer size and in consumer interaction, um, you have to find out what works for consumers. And uh, consumers uh, are, as I mentioned, not always predictable. Think of, for example, uh, and I saw last uh, week, I saw a nice example of a booking site where uh, customers in, in a test, in an A-B test, so you have one scenario, another scenario, are being exposed with, uh, with a text where, for example, um, the one um, test says, uh, 
um, do you want to keep this data until the end of your contract or uh, do you want us to keep your data until a certain date and then you can just test um, where on, on which of these two scenarios the customers respond best if they understand it and then you choose from that uh, scenario that works best you move more fine grains to a next step and those are typical uh, scenarios that uh, you see in the user interaction design and that should be applied to implementing consent as well okay um when you say consent and you touch it as well quickly um do we really need consent so obviously we have the contracts we can yeah. use um but there's also this concept of legitimate interest and Currently, we see a lot of organizations um, coming up with this idea of legitimate interest. Say, um, I just recently read read, um, re read something on one of these uh, uh, data um, uh, protection policies of a company, which said, oh, we need to collect the data to stay in business. Uh, so we have a legitimate interest of it. So um, maybe you can also talk a little bit more about uh, your, your position on whether uh, the things we see in, around legitimate interest are valid or not? Yeah, well, first of all, I uh, think that legitimate interest is used as a kind of a blanket to uh, not have to do anything on uh, consent. Uh, so I think it's not uh, uh, completely well thought over. Um, if you look at uh, the uh, needs for a legitimate interest, that's not easy either. Um, um, you really have to have a legitimate interest. So there have to be a very clear purpose and you have to be very explicit to the consumers that you collect the data and uh, for which purposes you are collecting it. Then uh, the second thing with uh, legitimate interest is that there needs to be a necessity to do it. So there, there, it is not allowed if there is any other way to gather that information. So uh, the requirements for uh, legitimate interest are also pretty strict. And then the last important thing in uh, legitimate interest is that uh, you need to balance the interest, uh, the legitimate interest of yourself as a company with the legitimate interest of the consumer. And that has to be in balance. And you have to uh, keep a record. So uh, legitimate interest assessment all the time. So. Legitimate interest is uh, indeed applicable in uh, some occasions, but it's not, it doesn't come for free either. And um, uh, yeah, so you need to maintain it. And uh, as from the moment on, the responsibility relies on you as a company. So it's your responsibility to treat that data well. And, and the authorities may ask you, uh, well, if you have this legitimate interest assessment, if you really can only uh, use it in, if it can gather this data in this way, did you do this, did this balancing? So um, there's a lot to, uh, and if you look at the current implementation, uh, which we consider as 12% of consent management, uh, maybe we're not right. Maybe uh, uh, part of that, so of these 88 remaining percent uh, should, could be covered by legitimate interest. But um, it is not the case that 100% uh, of that can be covered by legitimate interest. So um, start working on consent. That is, uh, that would be my message. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. Uh, a lawyer a while ago told, uh, said a nice sentence in a session I've been doing with him, and he said, "You know, just earning money is not a legitimate interest." in the context of GDPR. So just because you earn more money, you don't have a legitimate interest. And I think that is very important to understand. So if your business model um, yeah. does, uh, does depend on collecting data without consent and without contracts, you don't have the legitimate interest. Now, the, the, the intention of the law, and, and I spoke with a lawyer who uh, works at the European Commission, um, and he said, um, if you have any questions about interpretation of the law, think of why the law is there. And uh, the law is there to empower uh, the consumer and to avoid misuse. And if you think that uh, by 
pulling, putting a blanket with legitimate interest over everything that you don't want to ask or don't dare to ask, then you are not uh, uh, complying to GDPR at all. Okay, so in the interest of time, maybe one last question. So, um, when you look at applications you have, you might have a lot of applications. Um, ideally, you have one place where you manage your consent, um, where you manage your customer identities, because otherwise you might end up with having different states of consent, which um, makes things even worse. Uh, but how, how, how do applications, how do, how do you work between sort of your central consent and the applications yeah. which need to act according uh, to the current state of consent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, uh, actually that is a, a, a problem that we have solved in uh, IT and even in identity management in the past. Um, we uh, are familiar with provisioning, uh, so that means that you can provision uh, consent when it changes to uh, consuming applications. We now see um, uh, API uh, gateways with uh, distribution consent. Um, going forward, we expect that the consent will be standardized as well. Uh, so we see standardization uh, where we now are used to using SKIM uh, as a protocol to exchange user information. We will see that in uh, consent as well, but that will take a few years before that is standardized. Uh, the application that uh, has this consent should also provide a uh, get consent. So it's not only push consent, but it's also uh, an application should be able to ask the central consent store, can I get, can I use this data for uh, marketing purposes or for customer care or for whatever reason? So um, there are various ways how you can exchange. One is uh, pushing it through provisioning. One way is um, uh, getting consent and uh, the last way that I already uh, mentioned during uh, my presentation is that you include uh, consent information in a SAML assertion or in any other uh, authentication token and that is also uh, pretty well available. Okay, thank you Martin. So we are close to the top of the hour. Um, I hope this was very helpful to the audience. Thank you Martin for your presentation. Thank you for, to the audience for attending this Kubinga Cold webinar. Um, as I've said, the recording and the slide decks will be available soon for download. Hope to have you soon at one of our other upcoming events or webinars. Have a nice day, bye.